At this point, I'd like to invite to the stage um, Professor Jonathan Leap, um, who is uh, the Executive Director of the International Growth Center here at the LSE, to come and give us his speech on the Africa prosperity. Welcome, Jonathan. Thank you very much. Your Excellency, uh, distinguished guests, uh, and very pleased also to recognize Baroness uh, Verma, who's joined us. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to be here, to be part of this, uh, this conference, which brings together such important stakeholders uh, in Africa, both from Africa, but also from, uh, from London, from the LSE, uh, for uh, such a constructive dialogue. What I want to talk about today is, uh, to try to give you a little bit of an uh, overview of how we see the issue of African prosperity and the drivers of African prosperity. It's easy now to think that these prospects have dimmed if we look at the experience of the past two years. Uh, we see how slowing economic growth and particularly the collapse of commodity prices has hit African economies uh, very hard. Uh, we know that Fiscal deficits are widening, current account deficits are widening, debt positions are worsening. Many African currencies have fallen between 20 and 40 percent against the dollar uh, since 2014. Against this background, it's quite difficult to remember that just two years ago, we were at what seemed then the sort of crest of two decades of unprecedented stability and prosperity. And I think it's important to bear in mind just how much was achieved between the mid-1990s uh, and uh, where we are today. The overall size of the sub-Saharan economy doubled in that period, and growth was broad-based. We saw high growth not only in large economies like Nigeria and Ethiopia, but also in smaller frontier economies like Ghana and Uganda, and even in fragile states in the Democratic Republic of the Congo and, and in Angola. There's no question that the recent turmoil will require tough response. It will require tough and carefully managed macroeconomic and fiscal adjustments. But the strength and the broad-based nature of the growth that preceded the last couple of years also reflected not just contingent factors, the HIPAC initiative as the Vice President uh, recalled and the strong global growth, particularly from China, but elsewhere as well. Not only those external factors, but also very strong internal drivers. That what we saw, again, as the Vice President uh, mentioned, was strong moves uh, towards democratization, increasing accountability, improved governance, and all of these coming together in a new approach to policy, particularly to economic policy, that saw, saw much deeper structural <coughs> reforms than we've seen uh, previously, and also saw an increasing number of policy innovations, with Africa becoming a leader in many areas of economic policy. The International Growth Center works with 10 partner countries in Africa, including Zambia, and we have country teams based in each of these countries. And what we see is that despite the current challenges, policy reforms continue. And together with a strong and increasing focus on structural transformation, we believe these will provide the foundation not just for higher growth, but for higher rates of job creation as well as we move forward. The aim of the IGC is to support sustainable growth in developing countries by providing demand-led policy advice based on frontier <coughs> research. Bringing the ideas from frontier research into policy has long been at the core of the LSE's international mission. And it's at the core of the new Africa Center here as well. And it's a challenge that's particularly relevant for developing countries where knowledge gaps tend to be larger and where access to top 
resources and researchers can be more limited. The IGC, by combining a global network of top researchers with local embedded country teams and lo local research networks, is able to bring researchers together with policymakers in a collaborative approach that we call co-generation of knowledge, a process that starts from the very beginning of defining collaboratively with our partner governments what the research agenda should be, what the growth research agenda should be, and then carrying out that research in collaboration with governments as well. And I'll give you a, a few examples uh, as, I, as I go along of, of where uh, this has happened, including in, uh, in Zambia. If you remember just one thing from my remarks, I hope it will be this picture. Because this picture shows us just how closely linked are prosperity and productivity. On the horizontal axis is per capita GDP, so a measure of prosperity for countries. And on the vertical axis is total factor productivity. Broadly speaking, how much uh, uh, economies are able to produce for a given number of inputs, whether those are labor inputs or capital inputs. And what we see is a very, very strong correlation, an almost one-for-one one correlation between increases in productivity and increases in prosperity. So achieving prosperity is all about achieving sustained increases in productivity. There's been a sea change in research on growth and development in the last decade or so. And the fundamental realization and the fundamental finding that has emerged is that the heart of the growth challenge is the problem of misallocation of resources. If we look at poor and lower income countries, what we see is a huge fraction of the population trapped in low productivity activities, trapped in subsistence agriculture, in agricultural labor, and in street trading. Those low productivity activities will never be the foundation for prosperity. So two things have to happen for countries to achieve prosperity. The first is we have to shift people out of low productivity activities into higher productivity activities. This means not just little handouts that keep them ticking along, but it means interventions that move them into new occupations, into new, more productive activities. The second thing we have to do is to raise productivity across the board for individuals and firms. And in part, this means reallocating resources towards the most productive activities in the economy. So the key to prosperity is productivity. We at the IGC focus on what we see as four key drivers of prosperity. Effective government, productive firms, reliable and sustainable energy, and functioning cities. Effective government is really the starting point in that development is almost impossible uh, without effective government. And it's almost impossible for the private sector to generate rising incomes in the absence of effective government. So let me give you a couple of examples of the, uh, the issues and ideas that are so important for effective government. The first is that it's all about tax. My colleague here, Tim Besley, who's the W. Arthur Lewis Professor of Development at the LSC, wrote in a very important work published just uh, last year that the distinguishing difference between developing countries and developed countries is how much they raise in tax revenue. Developing countries tending to raise between 10 and 20 percent, developed countries between 30 and 40 percent. Now, we always used to think that it was low levels of development that inhibited the tax system, that made it hard uh, to raise taxes. And of course, of course that's true. But what he's made clear is that the causality goes the other way as well that higher tax revenues can drive development. Now, there's an obvious reason that's the case, and there's a not-so-obvious reason that's the case. The obvious reason that's the case is because the government needs resources to make the investments in education, in health, and in infrastructure that are needed to drive growth and to drive productivity. 
The not so obvious reason is that as tax revenues increase, the government becomes a more and more important shareholder in the economy. The government has a big stake in the productive economy when tax revenues are significant. Why is that important? Because it shifts attention away from attempts to extract resources from the economy in order to conduct certain activities towards one of saying, how can we make the whole pie bigger? Because that will generate rising revenues. How can we invest in infrastructure, human uh, resources, in a way that can generate more prosperity for the economy and more revenues for government? So the tax system brings into strong alignment the incentives for government and the incentives for uh, the economy and the, and the uh, community, the society as a whole. So tax revenue can drive, uh, can drive development. So that, of course, raises the question, well, how do we do that? How do we drive up tax revenues? Let me just give you uh, one example here, which is um, from research that we actually did with our, our partner country in Asia, in Pakistan. And what this, this is a project where for more than five years we have worked in close collaboration with the tax and excise department in the Punjab province of Pakistan. And working with them, we have conducted controlled experiments of how different incentives for tax collectors can change uh, overall outcomes. And just briefly, what this shows is that, let's see if I can point, yeah, is that uh, in two successive years, using performance incentives for tax collectors has led to an 11 to 12% increase in revenues. And what's particularly exciting about this is that one of the big impacts of using incentives wisely, and that doesn't necessarily mean using them continuously, is that they boost, uh, they, they expand the tax net in a one-off and permanent way. If you bring into the tax net a taxpayer who's never previously paid taxes, you've got her forever. If you bring in a property or a firm into the tax net, you've got them forever. So incentives used judiciously, even just occasionally, can make a fundamental difference to the breadth uh, uh, of the tax system. This is another thing we've done, and this is in Zambia, a project. And this is, starts from the recognition that effective government requires effective people in government. And we have too often neglected the importance of recruitment and retention and incentivizing our civil servants to make government as effective as it can be. In this example, IGC researchers worked with the Ministry of Health in Zambia, which was poised to roll out a new program aimed at articulating the health system into rural areas. The problem was you can't just send nurse, nurses or other health practitioners from Lusaka into the rural areas because more often than not, they want to come back. So you need to recruit and retain people in the local areas. And the question was, well, how do you do that? And it was recognized early on that money was not enough. And so the government was poised to use what we would call pro-social motivation, that is, try to get people who are really devoted to their community. And our researchers said, yes, we think that's a good strategy, but let's try an alternative as well. So what were the two? These are the posters that advertise the, the jobs. And in 24 of the first 48 districts, the advertisement said, do you want to serve your community? Become a community health worker. And in the other 24, they instead focused on career ambition rather than community orientation. And they said, do you become a community health worker to gain skills and boost your career? Very briefly, what we found, and we tracked these, the results over three years, is that not only did the latter strategy give people, uh, recruit people with higher matric scores and better overall competence, but it led to higher performance on the job. They did more visits per day, and the visits weren't shorter. Um, but after three years, the health outcomes were better. We saw more births in clinics. We saw a reduction in infant mortality. We see a whole range of benefits from this. And you know what? They don't even have a lower pro-social motivation. They rank the same in pro-social motivation as, as these groups did, and yet bring with them additional skills. The importance here is not so much that it's always going to be right to advertise career ambition, but that you've got to test things. You've got to figure out what's the right strategy to get what we want. And in fact, our researchers are now working with a range of other ministries in Zambia to explore other recruitment challenges and how they can be uh, addressed. 
I want to change and just really address the point the Vice President raised about how important democracy is. This is a study uh, done by colleagues at the IGC that really tried to unpack uh, what happens with ethnic favoritism and, what, and, and, and whether democracy interacts with that in an important way. And these are results from Kenya. And what you see on the graph is road expenditure. Um, and the blue line tells you how much of that expenditure is taking place in areas of the same ethnic group as the president. And the red areas are areas that are non-co-ethnic with the president. Now, what I want you to look at in particular are the vertical bars. Because what the vertical bars do is tell you that something changed politically. The solid bars tell you a change from democracy to autocracy, whereas the dashed bars tell you a change in president. What's unusual about Kenya and why this was such a good set, uh, setting to do this investigation was the two didn't coincide. You had changes in the political regime with the same president that happened twice. Well, what do we see here? We see that under periods of democracy, there's really no ethnic favoritism going on at all. And we see that at the beginning, and we see that again at the end. That basically, the, the graphs bounce around one, which is equal spending between co-ethnic areas and non-co-ethnic areas. But when the economy shifted, when the, the, the country shifted into autocracy, look what happens to road spending. It goes up to more than twice uh, the level in co-ethnic areas, twice the level in non ethnic areas. If you look at road kilometers built, and these guys spent years re constructing these figures from Michelin maps from 1960 to the, president, to the present, if you look at road kilometers built, the fraction is five times. Five times more kilometers were built in co-ethnic areas than non-co-ethnic areas. What's democracy doing here? Well, democracy is increasing accountability. Democracy is increasing transparency. Democracy just brings this dynamic that leads, it seems, to more efficient and effective public spending. OK, I, I think in the interest of time, uh, I'll, I'll just describe this very briefly, which means you probably won't really understand, but it's just I, I couldn't resist including it. And this was the Green Revolution has passed Africa by. Right? Look at the blue line. That's Africa. This is Southeast Asia. What's happened? Why have yields not increased? Well, is it that the science hasn't arrived? No. The science is there. The problem is the economics isn't working. And that's the point that has been brought up by our, a study we've done in, in Uganda. What you see on this ground, the green bars are telling you the urea content of fertilizers as bought in the shop. And it's nothing like what it should be. There's the red line. That's what it should be. But by the time it gets to the local retailer, the, you know, inadequate storage, people cutting it with other stuff, all sorts of stuff happens, and what they're buying is nothing like the quality they should be buying. If they were buying the original, authentic things, they would have a return on their investment of 50%. Buying the crap they get in the local retor re the retailers, the return is minus 12%. So of course they're not gonna get it. Of course they're not gonna get it. So, so we need to crack the economic problems here in order to crack the productivity problem in agriculture. A really important lesson if we look, once we start looking at manufacturing and industry, is that small is not beautiful. Small firms systematically have much lower productivity levels than large firms. That doesn't mean small are, are, firms aren't important, but what's important about small firms is that they become large firms. And if that ain't gonna happen, then that we support large firms. Why might those two things be different? Well, a study by John Sutton, who's a colleague here at LSE, did an e enterprise map of five different uh, countries, including, including Zambia, uh, but the, the one I'm citing here is Ethiopia. And what he found is of the 50 largest manufacturing country, companies in Ethiopia, 26 of them started life not as small firms, but as trading firms, small manufacturing firms, but as trading firms. So it's this connectivity that seems very important to driving productivity. So we want to be really careful about putting too many policy eggs in the small firm basket because most Googles stay in the garage. We need to think about how we support bigger firms and how we get productivity growth, and a lot of that is going to be in big firms. Okay, energy and growth, the, the Vice President's already spoken eloquently about this. The only point I would add is that when we think about fixing these outage problems that uh, she mentioned, when we think of, of solving the access problems, we've got to think about the demand side. You can't treat energy as a right 
because if it's a right, then people won't have an incentive to pay for it, and then if you don't have a stream of revenues to finance electricity, you're not going to be able to supply it. So it's not enough to think about the supply side. We've got to think about the demand side and make sure we end energy theft, make sure we end incompetent uh, collection, so we drive the stream of revenues that can support generation over time. And finally, I want to talk about urbanization, and it's always useful, I think, to look at these pictures of Africa by night. And what you see is, compared, for example, to India, that economic activity remains too low in Africa. We see the spots, you know, we see uh, Abidjan, we see Accra, we see Lagos, we see Abuja, we see, of course, Cape Town and Johannesburg, we see Addis, we see Kigali, Kampala, and so forth, but then we don't see a lot of lights other than that. What do we need to do? We need to drive urbanization in Africa. Why? Because cities promote, cities are engines of productivity. They drive productivity because they allow scale and they allow specialization. We know that doubling city size can increase productivity by three to eight percent. Now that may sound a little bit small, but what it means is that you compare a city of 300,000 with a city of five million, the city of five million has 30 percent higher productivity. So cities can be engines of productivity and engines of prosperity. But cities are really hard to get right. Africa has urbanized at a much earlier stage of development than most advanced economies, much lower levels of per capita income. And that makes it challenging because cities are policy intensive. They require tough regulation. They require uh, a whole set of legal planning and other sorts of frameworks to be effective. And they require expensive investment, expensive infrastructure. So we need to think about how that's going to happen in the more challenging environment in Africa. The key, and if you're going to remember one thing about cities, the key is connectivity. And that's even true beyond cities. That what we need to have is cities that have low transport costs and livable density so we get the benefits of scale and specialization. The final thing I want to do is to touch on something that I know is uh, where the Vice President has been a true, a true leader, and this is women's empowerment. Women's empowerment is another driver of growth. And just let me give you a couple of, of, of examples from work that we've done. The first is a negotiation skills training place uh, uh, program in Zambia, which showed strong increases in girls, this was aimed at teenage girls, in, in girls uh, taking control of key decisions uh, in their life. And that's now gone from a pilot, which is what was published in 22, uh, 2012, into a full-blown uh, randomized control trial. The second, which I have more data from because the randomized control trial is finished, is in Uganda, and it's about teaching vocational and life skills uh, to teenage girls. And what we find there, and let me just give you this, the number of people engaging in income generating activities, the number of girls, up 72%. The monthly consum consumption expenditures, up 41%. Teen pregnancy, down 26%. Early marriage, down 58%. Share of girls reporting sex against their will, down 50%. These are, these are life-changing uh, results. And we need to focus more on this straight across the continent because the benefits in terms of prosperity will be substantial. Finally, Mike Spence, who chaired the Growth Commission some years ago, said that there's no recipe for growth or growth and prosperity. There are only ingredients. And I want to close just with a point that Dr. Akebe made at our African Growth Forum in Addis. He's a minister in the office of the Prime Minister, economic advisor to the Prime Minister in Ethiopia. And he said, quite rightly, that it's policy independence that is the key to structural transformation and growth. Research from the IGC, from the LSE, and others can give you a much better idea of what the ingredients are. But it's the policymakers themselves that need to lead this process and decide the recipe that will work for their countries. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. That was amazing. Those figures are astounding, life-changing. Just before I pass it, um, the, the, the button on to the audience for q and I'd like to, to, to make a point here. You said we should crack. So I was thinking, shouldn't we be cracking the mindset? Because a lot of what you said points to economic sabotage. Um, In what way do you mean? When you talk about alter, alter, um, uh, sorry, adulterating the, the fertilizers, you talk about uh, uh, energy theft, 
you know. And then again, the big issue, women and girls empowerment. I mean, too much to talk about now, but I thought, shouldn't we be cracking the mindset? Look at that advert you showed us. Become a health worker to boost your career and improve your skills. Or do you want to serve your community to become a health worker? And uh, that ties straight to the heart of transformational leadership, which says if you can tie wider objectives to individual aspirations, then we might just begin to get around that, that issue. But I don't know what your thoughts on that are. No, I think that's a, that's a very deep uh, observation. And I think it's true on all levels. Um, uh, what I wanted to do in finishing was to say how important leadership is at the very top level. That's right. But I think you're absolutely right. It runs straight through. Straight and through. I think... Very strong uh, thread. It's a very strong thread. I think that you know, what, what, drives, um, what drives development is, is running leadership from top to bottom. Top to bottom. And, uh, and you know, there are no imported solutions. I think that's why, that's why engagement of researchers in Africa is so important. It's not like African countries can look around and find a solution somewhere else that they can just bring in and will solve their problems. They're organic. They should be organic. And they need to, sorry? They should be organic. They need to be organic. But they need inputs. They need new ideas. They need rigorous evidence. And then they need to say, OK, how are we going to solve our problem? Thank you. You're getting straight to my heart, leadership in Africa. Leadership is contextual. Thank you very much. So I'll open up that to the audience. Any questions? I'm going to take um, for the, uh, we have a shortage of time. I'll take a uh, maximum of three questions. So I'll take from each, each side of the room. OK, I can see one hand over there. There's a lot of hands. I can see one, <laughs> one hand at the other end and a lot of hands in the middle. So can I give it to the gentleman right there first? Yes. Yes, please. No, the, the, the gentleman in front. Can I, can you, yes. There you go. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for your talk. It was very insightful. Um, the points you hit on um, tax revenue is, um, is very salient. But um, with regard to the total amount being like um, forfeited by tax, would you think um, uh, as a low-hanging fruit, is it better to develop, go through the process of developing tax policies, because this um, um, developing and reinforcing tax policies can be very consuming and um, hard to implement, or for the global community to look into transfer pricing, to look into corporations actually not paying the fund. Because, um, do you think this will present a better pro um, proposition as opposed to chasing subsistence farmers for taxes? No, uh, transfer pricing is important and we need action there, but it's no substitute for strengthening domestic resource mobilization. No, you, we really need to have governments moving strongly to strengthen their ability to, to become a shareholder in their economy. And that means effectively taxing individual incomes, not at high rates, but in a broad-based way that enables low rates to raise revenue, and taxing corporate profits in a sustainable way as well, and in a realistic way. If you are, uh, another bit of research we've done says that uh, developed solutions, tax solutions, don't import well into developing countries in many cases. So um, taxing um, turnover may be better than taxing profits, or at least having the, op yeah, having the option of doing those two in environments where compliance and enforcement uh, are difficult. But no, I think that the short answer is that there's no substitute for building uh, strong domestic resource mobilization um, I I inside each country and, and then separately pursuing action on transfer pricing. Taxing turnover means we might also check capital flight. Yes, can help. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, there's uh, the gentleman at the other end. Can can we hear? Hello, and many thanks for your speech. My question is on the point you raised about um, connectivity in in Africa, and I think another point was raised on globalization, and and growth as well of of scale of, of companies. My question really is um, getting around in Africa, getting from one city to another, um, and basically for an African as well, having an African passport, getting from one country to another country is increasingly difficult. And in some cases, it's even better having a, a passport from a European country or a United States passport to get around Africa, as well as the cost to move from one country to another. I live in Accra, Ghana, and to travel to Abidjan, it costs about 500 US dollars to fly, a 40-minute flight. So what would you say about um, connectivity and really improving the globalization and intra-Africa trade, which today sits about 10% compared to developed regions where it's in the 70s and 80%? Yeah. No, it's a, it is a big challenge. Um, I think um, 
connectivity uh, to a significant extent follows economic activity. So um, you know, it, it, we're not going to have lots of intra-African flight connections until there are higher levels of economic interaction that can support that. But I think where uh, there is action being uh, taken, and particularly I'm thinking of these sort of big regional transport projects, the transport corridors and so forth, um, those will, I think, have a substantial payoff over time. Seems to me, based on, on sort of what's happening, uh, what's happened in the last five years or so, and I'm thinking particularly of East Africa, that regional uh, efforts uh, are very promising. Um, partly, I think, because it's easier to capture the benefits for smaller groupings, at least as the first building block. Um, but I'm very impressed with the progress that, that the East African community has made on a number of fronts. And I think it is a bit of a model. I mean, you know, we, regional integration has not had an uncheckered history in Africa. And I think it has to be hard-nosed. It has to focus on where things can really be achieved. But I think where we have examples of that, and as I said, East Africa really stands out, I think it looks like a very promising strategy. So I think, of, of course, the African Union, African Union is, is very important, and we need coordination at that level. But I think uh, at the sub-regional level, I think coordination can be more effective in, in uh, many of these sort of nuts and bolts things. In terms of boosting connectivity, I think it's very important. Thank you. I think there's a huge railway project at, at yes, the East of Africa exactly. now, trying to link these African communities. OK, we'll take one final question from the other end. A woman, please. <laughs> Gender empowerment. Yes, the lovely lady in blue. Thank you. Hi, um, I was wondering, do you think African leaders lack the political will to implement any of these um, fantastic ideas you've had? Because these solutions are not nothing new. They're not so outlandish that we can come up with them, right? So do you think they lack the political will? Because yesterday we had a uh, discussion on illicit outflows. And I posed the question, what do you think about FinTech and blockchain? where perhaps when Africa gets aid, it could be done through cryptocurrency so we could track them. But they seem to not really be in line with technology or to move it forward. Do you think they lack the political will to implement all these things? Or some of them are just very happy to you know, take the accolades and positions but not really do much in their time as politicians? Mm. Political. Well, having uh, talked about the importance of leadership, I guess I would say, maybe it's as an economist, that we shouldn't focus too much on individual sort of foibles as uh, explaining or, or excusing anything, but think instead of what's the incentive structure within which these leaders are operating. And the more we can build a structure, and I'm thinking about accountability, I'm thinking about transparency, um, uh, and, and e-government, which the Vice President talked about, is hugely uh, important in this, in this regard in terms of increasing transparency in what governments do. If we can work, and I think this is at the level where individual citizens can make a difference, if we can work to enhance the incentive structure uh, straight across the continent, I think that'll have a big payoff in the quality of leadership. So I don't think there's any, I mean, we see so many examples of strong and capable leadership across Africa. But I think where it falls short, we should look first to the environment in which they operate and say, what needs to change here for this to create the incentives to bring the strong leaders uh, to the top and to enable them to be effective. So I think that's what I would say, is that we need to think hard about incentives, how we can improve those, and that that can help drive changes in, in leadership. Thank you very much. And with that, we'll come to the end of the morning session. There's tea and coffee out in the foyer. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you.